Microphones, careful with your eardrums. So, um, um, so what uh, Jaume asked me, it's uh, to present a new clinical trials, what we are doing clinically uh, at St. Jude. Also a little bit of, uh, uh, I'll tell you about uh, the pediatric brain tumor consortium, but uh, uh, not in details. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'll tell you about our biologic study. Uh, um, it's not only for autopsies, but most of the, the tissues obtained at autopsies. So um, I did it on purpose. I, it's a busy slide. And in fact, I tried as best as possible to cut the fat, as they, they say in English. So, so for us to, to, to really uh, address the important uh, new issues that I have to, to present to you. So this is, the, the, to, my, to my knowledge, the eight studies that uh, some people, I think, uh, Ophelia already uh, alluded to some of them. So 63 patients, to the best of my knowledge, because some of the studies, you can tell that, uh, that the patients are redundant. Okay, so this is particular. Uh, uh, samples from Pittsburgh uh, that we've collected over the years. So, so there are at least, I think, two studies where the, 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 the samples overlap. So what we know <coughs> is that the PCP3 gene is mutated in half of this uh, 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 sample. We know that uh, the, the 17P53 uh, is located, uh, is lost in, 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 in all, close to 60% of the samples. We know that uh, 10Q, this is a study from 1993. Um, Ah, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I keep uh, so so. Uh, we know that 10Q um, um, was lost in in 43% of cases. This is where only seven cases analyzed, and Peter mutation was seen in only one case. And, and most recently, there are two studies analyzing uh, uh, this uh, the protein RNA level, the interleukin 13 receptor alpha 2, afferent A2, and surviving uh, in patients with diffuse brainstem glioma. That's it. Okay, to the best of my knowledge. And uh, there's another paper that I didn't put, I mean, talking about the methodology of proteomics, but uh, that's, that's the knowledge that we have about, about uh, the, the biology of diffuse brainstem gliomas in kids. Um, this is, I put uh, briefly, this is, uh, so people have already alluded to, this is the work of the Richard Gilbertson as part of the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium, 28 uh, samples. Um, and basically, the, the very short here, we, he showed us the tumor grade uh, increased, the, the expression of uh, EGFR also increased, and uh, you see limited number of samples he analyzed EGFR, but it seems that, uh, that in the higher grade tumors it was more common, very limited number of samples. So <coughs> just to, uh, um, the rationale, at, at St. Jude particular, I'll emphasize uh, during my presentation, we, we, we have been trying for the past, I would say, 10 years, uh, trying to, 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 uh, to work very closely with our uh, um, uh, neurobiology uh, colleagues, I mean, so trying to put, I mean, to make uh, uh, um, uh, treatments based on, on, on biology. So the, the other thing we don't know about uh, diffuse brainstem gliomas, but we know that the majority of these tumors are diagnosis, they represent uh, high-grade gliomas. So we know, I don't need to tell you, this is an example of a glioblastoma arising elsewhere. <coughs> but uh, you see the endovascular proliferation there. And we know the angiogenesis is crucial uh, for these tumors. And we know that the vascular endothelial growth factor and, and uh, its receptor are the, among the most important uh, uh, pro-angiogenic uh, pathways. And there, I mean, you have uh, heard about trials uh, looking at bevacizumab, and you are aware of the very promising result of the use of bevacizumab in adults. Uh, there are also uh, promising uh, results of use AZD-2171, which is also a VEGF, uh, this is a pun um, tyrosine kinase, but also a VEGF receptor. Um, so what I'm telling you, it's the basis, biologic basis for our St. Jude, our, our uh, current St. Jude study that uh, just got completed. So this is just to tell you, I mean, the, the for, the past 10 years, um, the treatment of kids with uh, diffuse uh, intrinsic pontine glioma has been uh, a priority at St. Jude. So it depends, I, I use other statistics than Ophelia, but depending on the statistics, it's either 20% uh, or, 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 because I calculated 10, uh, 200 patients per year in the United States, but we treated 20 patients last year with uh, DIPGs. And um, so, so, so over the years, we, we support not only our studies, but uh, also PBTC studies. So, so this is our uh, phase one uh, study, SJBG07, that, uh, that uh, just got completed. Uh, basically, we use uh, irradiation, uh, everything very conventional. In fact, uh, we, we, we went those a little bit lower for, instead of 55.8, we used uh, 54 for convenience of the radiation oncologist. And uh, we use this medication, Vandetanib. Um, it's not a medication commercially available. 
And uh, basically, it's a VEGF receptor too. It's also a pump tyrosine kinase, but it's a VEGF receptor too. It's uh, at a uh, higher concentrations. Uh, it's also VEGF receptor three. It's uh, it's been used uh, um, in adults, and there's a study in kids, uh, rat uh, inhibitor. It's been used also for thyroid uh, cancer, and it's also an EGFR inhibitor at uh, at higher doses. So I tell you, I told you, I mean, the basis, I mean, basically targeting VEGF uh, receptor 2 and EGFR in these tumors, these are two targets that, uh, that we believe are important uh, in, um, in diffuse intrinsic pontine gliomas. This is just briefly, this is, in fact, this is data from Duke, so I'll be careful presenting this to Sri, but uh, this is, uh, um, basically, this is work uh, from uh, Jeremy Rich, published uh, three years ago four years ago, and uh, basically he looked at uh, preclinical models, both cell lines and xenografts. Interestingly, there were two xenografts derived from pediatric uh, uh, patients, so that we, something that we hardly see, and uh, basically to, to show that, uh, not surprising, other medications had activity, but uh, this medication had activity. This is a subcutaneous uh, uh, xenograft, uh, but uh, they also tested several uh, orthotoxic uh, uh, xenografts, so here's the, the, the bandetanib, uh, the delay in tumor growth. And, um, and a second study here, so sorry, I'm going to put all my arrows there since, um, and basically to show you, this is another study using, um, this one was a subcutaneous uh, xenograft, not a pediatric one, but uh, just to show you um, uh, um, an additive effect when, when you added uh, radiation with vandetanib. I'm not going to discuss with you the, the, the there's a good amount of rationale. Um, I don't think I need to, to discuss with this audience uh, uh, about uh, adding a VEGF receptor during um, irradiation. There's this theory of, uh, of uh, vessel normalization. We know, we know that VEGF, EGFR, they are both uh, upregulated during radiation. So, so this is uh, definitely uh, 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 um, an interesting study design. So we did this phase one at St. Jude only. Um, I mean, typical objectives for phase one, uh, so they determine the MTD and uh, characterize the DLTs uh, uh, of the, this medication in children, and we had several. We had several secondary objectives that I'm going to just uh, briefly mention to you, okay, because we are still putting this data together, but we did as a single institution, we were able to put uh, this, uh, to, 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 to do it uh, in a lot of details. So this is uh, the five dosage levels uh, that were tested, and just to show you, the 65 milligrams, um, per meter square, it's equivalent to, to the phase two, uh, phase two dose of this medication. So this medication is being pursued in adults, particularly for lung cancer, for non-small cell lung cancer, and for thyroid cancer, okay? So, so um, and, uh, but I mean, the maximal tolerated dose in adults, in fact, is 300 milligrams. So we went a little bit lower than, than the 300 milligrams uh, um, in adults. And uh, here are the, the details. So from June 2007 until uh, December, uh, 2008, we treated 25 patients at St. Jude. Um, so we treated uh, doses level one, two, and three. We had three patients, and the two other doses levels, uh, we had uh, six patients. And we, in the design of the study, we expanded uh, the, the highest uh, doses level to 10 patients after the, 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 the DLT had, uh, the, I'm sorry, the MTD, after the maximal tolerated dose had already been determined. So, um, Th th this is like any trials for diffuse brainstem gliomas. This is, uh, you see some of my patients, they are, they are barely four weeks into treatment, but uh, 13 patients have already experienced disease progression, and 12 have died of disease progression, and we have unfortunate autopsies on several of these patients. They all have glioblastoma multiforme. And um, so 10 patients remain on therapy, uh, range from four weeks uh, to, I have two patients that are going um, uh, to, uh, 16 months uh, um, uh, since uh, um, the enrollment on the study. So this is a map of the United States, uh, just to show you. So, uh, sorry, Memphis, it's a, it's a small dot there. So, 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 so for you guys, I, I don't think anyone, raise your hand if you've ever been in Memphis. <laughs> Oops, there you go. So, so, so the patients do not come from Memphis. Okay, in Memphis, it's, it's uh, a million people. So the, the patients are coming from all over the, the, the United States. So this is our catchment area. And... Um, um, so the toxicity, basically we, 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 we didn't reach a maximal tolerated dose. Um, we had one patient at the 110 milligrams per meter square uh, dose level that she developed rash, mucositis, and uh, so the medication was held, but I also sent uh, 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 a mouth culture, and uh, three weeks later, surprise, surprise, uh, it was growing C, uh, CMV. Okay, so, so at least the CMV could account for part of her uh, symptoms and uh, the second patient, um, she was uh, a very obese uh, lady, uh, young uh, lady, and basically she received a dose that uh, was uh, even higher than the MTD in adults. So, 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 um, 
she developed diarrhea uh, five weeks into treatment, and upon reduction of the dose, she, she, she had the recurrence of the, her diarrhea. It's something that we have particularly seen as uh, we increase the dose, we saw more of uh, EGFR side effects like diarrhea, uh, um, uh, infected uh, toenails, uh, uh, paronychia, so some of the, the, the side effects that are compatible with an uh, EGFR inhibitor. But uh, based on the design of a, of a, uh, of a phase one study, we never, we never reach uh, an MTD. And uh, surprise, surprise, I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm just being ironic, it's not any surprise. Uh, uh, as you see, as you treat these patients for a longer period of time, if you treat more patients, then, then, then you start seeing more problems. So at one point, I didn't see much of, uh, of uh, the, the common side effects of uh, VEGF uh, inhibitors, and I was celebrating, but, uh, but cautiously celebrating, because I said, is the medication doing anything? And, uh, and then by, by the, the, the fifth dose level, we saw, we saw particularly some chronic uh, grade two uh, toxicities, uh, so we saw grade one um, EKG uh, uh, prolongations of the QTC interval uh, um, in the EKGs. We saw some patients with proteinuria grade one, grade two maximum, but um, we ended up, we saw, we saw some other um, um, uh, nasty side effects beyond, beyond the six weeks of uh, DLT evaluation period and some uh, side effects that are expected. So these are the other side effects. Lymphopenia, it's interesting. Lymphopenia we have seen, and it's something common. Uh, Darren can tell you, I mean, we have also experience with erlotinib. You see lymphopenia with these medications, with these EGFR inhibitors, even without dexamethasone. So all these kids, they need to be on PCP prophylaxis. And it's something that we learned. I learned the hard way, and uh, because one of my patients developed, in fact, a PCP uh, pneumonia, and it's being treated. Um, um, Leukopenia, neutropenia, these were all temporary. This uh, hypophosphatemia, hyperkalemia, this is all, all temporary. But I mean, we had one patient with a grade three hypertension, so required two, two uh, uh, antihypertensive medications. And we had recently, beyond the DLT evaluation period, we had unfortunately a, a, a patient with a posterior reversible encephalopathy uh, syndrome. And uh, uh, again, if you're not familiar with this condition, this has been described with several other medications. It's, uh, it's described as being reversible, but uh, I can tell you that our patient got, uh, got really hurt by it. And uh, I know it's described again with bevacizumab, with AZD2171, and, uh, and we saw it. Uh, so, so we have seen more hypertension with this medication that, that uh, in, the, in the dose of level five. So uh, a word of caution there. So we have pharmacokinetics in all patients, and, uh, and I can tell you the, the, the distribution in kids is different than, than, than adults and uh, we have reached uh, levels, very uh, high levels, equivalent to, to adult levels. We have circulating endothelial cells in 90% of the patients. We have a lot, a lot of imaging uh, research from DTI to susceptibility uh, weighted. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, in fact, European colleagues um, uh, at St. Jude. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, research going on there. I mean, we are doing prospective. We are doing uh, two MRIs in the middle of, uh, of uh, radiation for the, these kids, I mean, to see to look for, for vascular uh, normalization. So there's a lot of research going on there, and we are also prospective looking at angiogenic factors. So I'm not going to, unless you have any specific questions, uh, I wasn't planning to, 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 to mention anything about this uh, to you. So this is just an example. See, the, the, I don't need to tell you, I think it's already been told, or, but I tell my patients, one child with diffuse brainstem glioma is different than the other. Okay, the tumor, so that's why we need, I, I am a firm believer in, 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 in biopsies, I mean, for this tumor in the future. And I'll tell you, I think the only thing I, did, I may defer uh, from other people is the timing. I don't think we are, we are ready now, but I'll tell you our St. Jude philosophy. So this is a 13-year-old, uh, presents to us. In, in fact, I mean, it's a patient um, from, from, from the New England area with uh, not only you see a diffuse brainstem glioma, but the tumor, nasty tumor, going all the way here to, to, the, to the left hemisphere. And uh, she had full-blown presentation with a neurogenic bladder. 16 months later, you see her MRI, she had, basically she had, she had, she had a, a complete response. As we mentioned, uh, someone already mentioned the uh, response. I'm not saying that she's cured. It's just, I mean, she's 16 months, so she has beaten a lot of odds there. I mean, she's at high risk of, of uh, growing back. Um, so, although the MTD was not rich, I mean, we, basically we are expanding the study now at the, at the second to uh, highest uh, dose level at 110 milligrams per meter square. And, um, um, so I, I started telling a little bit about our, our future plans. So, so we have a, a follow-up study already approved by the pharmaceutical company where we are going to, 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 to combine this medication with radiation with another small molecule inhibitor, okay? 
And, um, um, and this, my, our hope, my, my hope is that this will be, the next study will be, the successor study, will be the last uh, blind study that we do at St. Jude. Blind meaning that uh, it will be the last one that we don't do uh, based on, on, on biology. And that's the part now I, I um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about what uh, the PBTC has been doing, and then I'll tell you about the, the autopsy studies. So the PBTC, um, this is the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium. It's uh, eight hospitals in the country that uh, do particular phase one, phase two studies. So there are three uh, trials that uh, have been done through the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium for children with newly diagnosed diffuse brain stem glioma. So this is PBTC06, has already been published. I'm not, I, I'll just show you the curve as, as bad as all the others. And just to show you how interesting, this is, uh, I think there's one or two patients alive, and this is one of my patients. I swear to you, typical diffuse brainstem glioma. I work her up, was one of my first patients at St. Jude, full-blown findings. We had spectroscopy, you name it. And this is the MRI to show. Five years later, she has some sequel of her treatment. But uh, and, uh, the one thing I point to all my parents of my patients, she never had a, 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 a complete response or partial response. You still see changes there in flare five years later and she's out and about, as they say in English. So this is PBTC07, so this is, uh, the study has not been published, so limited what I can tell you, more than 50 patients treated, I can tell you that uh, we treated uh, close to 40% of the patients at St. Jude. So this is a combination of radiation and gefitinib, and uh, basically they recommend, there, there were a lot of issues with, uh, with this protocol, particularly we didn't know about the incidence of intratumoral hemorrhage, so this complicated a lot, a lot uh, the, the study. So the, the phase two was really the, the, the to establish it, it was a, a complicated process, but the recommended dose was 250 milligrams per day. So this has already been published as, as an abstract, and, uh, and the results of the phase two clio, uh, trial are not available. Again, I can tell you my, my St. Jude experience. Out of the many patients that we treated, we have one, one uh, survivor, and I'm putting here, in fact, I mean, for someone to tell me if you notice something different about this tumor, but, um, 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 so four years later, she's, she's the only survivor of, uh, of that study um, at St. Jude. So this is PBTC14, the last uh, uh, PBTC study. It's a trial with uh, radiation and this uh, tp farnib which is a farnesyl transferase inhibitor. And uh, so basically phase one is already published uh, in neuro-oncology. So the, the, the phase two uh, dose of uh, tp farnib along with radiation was determined. And uh, I can tell you this, this was published uh, um, as an abstract for SPNO. And uh, we treated also a third of the patients, and uh, and this is are the curves with uh, with uh, uh, TP for NIP. I decided, oops, I decided on purpose not to, to go over any more uh, PBTC trials because we have Mark and we have three here that have they they, they are the, the the principal investigators of some of these other studies at St. Jude. And these other studies, what we are talking about, these are studies for kids with the recurrent uh, progressive tumors, so not specifically kids with the newly diagnosed diffuse brainstem gliomas. The Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium has not had a, uh, uh, had a trial uh, open for children with newly diagnosed diffuse brainstem glioma since February 2008, okay? So um, uh, we are all talking uh, about biology. In, in fact, uh, Mark very eloquently, I mean, he already put a lot of the issues that, uh, unfortunately, I didn't put in my slides. Um, I don't have, I mean, his understanding of, uh, of uh, uh, a deep understanding of the biology, I mean, how to, 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 to do it in the lab. I'm the clinician putting, I mean, getting, getting these samples. So, so this is a, a, a picture that I, I got, in fact, from Peter Burger there when I was at Hopkins. And uh, I mean, hardly ever uh, we, we, we see a piece of, uh, of a diffuse brainstem glioma. And that's why, we, I mean, we, we, I mean, the resources are there. Um, uh, and um, the, the, the difficult part is get a, a hold of this tumor. So the story, 2005. One of my patients died of a diffuse brainstem glioma in the ward at St. Jude. Terrible, I mean, for patients in the United States who die in the hospital, it's because there's a problem, okay? So this uh, was a child that did, didn't have lots of problems with the, the biologic parents, and basically I raised the issue of an autopsy, because at that point we didn't know if the autopsy would generate the DNA and RNA of, uh, of uh, good quality, okay? So we had long discussions through the PBTC, and it was an issue race, because the, 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 the fastest autopsy that I ever got was uh, within two hours. Okay, and uh, so would this tissue, would, would, would it be of quality, I mean, for, for, for genome-wide studies? So this was done in May 2005, there in Memphis. So here to show you the, so we got a DNA of very high molecular weight, and we got a RNA of reasonable quality uh, to run an metrics. And I need to tell you, I don't know the standards on, uh, in other places, but uh, again, I'm kind of walking on, on eggs because it's not my, my expertise, but I understand the, the Hartwell Center at St. Jude is very, it's very picky about the quality, so the RNA was good enough, I mean, for them to run enough metrics. So this proved the principle, 
And um, so this is a, a prehistoric picture. This was 2005. I don't remember if it was 10K or whatever, but I mean, it was a, a SNP array. And uh, I cannot tell you more details because unfortunately I'm colorblind, so this doesn't mean anything for me. But uh, I understand that there's some greens, some reds there. <laughs> okay, so, so, so this, are, uh, this is an entire genome. All, all the, 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 the chromosomes there in a patient with a diffuse brain stem gland. So we proved that uh, this could be done. And um, so then we opened our study. So this is an RB uh, approved study. Uh, lots of hurdles uh, to, to have it open. I don't know how it works uh, uh, in, the, in Europe, but I have a feeling it's probably similar to, to what it uh, happens in Brazil. What I heard is that it's easier for Latin countries to get, uh, to get the tissue at biopsy than at autopsy. Okay? And um, so we had a lot of hurdles to the RB, took a long time. So basically the idea is to collect uh, fresh frozen tissue, um, but not only fresh frozen. So we are collecting lots and lots of paraffin embedded tissue. Uh, several of these uh, patients, unfortunately, we got the entire brain. So we, not only we have the tumor, but we have plenty of, uh, of a normal uh, brain. And uh, so the idea is to collect at, uh, at a biopsy. If, uh, if for some reason, I mean, the, the, the tissue was obtained, and I'll tell you the, the, what happened with the cases. And, um, and basically, we, we, we established uh, to validate uh, the, the results of uh, genome-wide studies in DNA and RNA, uh, both at the, the DNA level by, uh, via gene sequencing, fish, RNA with P PCR, and protein levels with immunostochemistry, Western blot. And uh, the other thing very interesting uh, is that uh, we, we established uh, to get a follow-up from these families. So, so um, we, we didn't think it would be ethical to, 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 to reach the families that did not consent. So, so, so basically we have reached, uh, I'll show you the, the, the families that have consented for the procedure. Different backgrounds, particularly in the United States, is a melting pot. And uh, so different people see how these parents, how, how, how the, 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 the procedure affected the, their lives and their grieving process. Um, so, um, so far, from June 2006 until February 2009, um, um, we obtained 26 tumor samples. Um, we have, I think, normal uh, tissue, either um, blood or, or, or particularly we are getting cerebellum uh, uh, as normal tissue. Uh, in, um, in, I think, one or two patients, we didn't get uh, normal tissue. The all autopsies have been performed in 24, uh, um, I'm sorry, autopsies has been, ha has been performed in 24 patients. Um, so uh, tissue diagnosis uh, was obtained at surgery in three patients. And I emphasize to you, they all had typical uh, diffuse brainstem gliomas. The first one was a very wealthy family. They came not to San Joe, they came to our surgeon. For, for they had obtained a, a different diagnosis elsewhere in the United States. So they were focused on surgery. No one would, uh, would convince them otherwise. So that's why he had surgery with a typical tumor. Um, we had a patient that had bled inside the tumor. Interestingly, her mom had, uh, had a glioblastoma multiform. As she bled inside the tumor, I mean, it, it, she, she had uh, an open surgery elsewhere. And uh, the third patient was one of my patients that uh, she had uh, basically a typical uh, uh, glioblastoma. But I mean, the, we offered uh, um, um, stereotactic biopsy in the family. Between the choice of stereotactic and open biopsy, they, they chose open biopsy. And unfortunately, one patient, one of our patients, the only patient that we have ever lost at St. Jude, so he died at diagnosis, and we obtained tissue at diagnosis. And uh, one of the patients, uh, um, um, we even got a tumor tissue at diagnosis and uh, at the time of progression. So this is the, I'm not going to each, so th this is the, the reach of the, the, so this is half the half uh, part of the United States. And uh, sorry, this is uh, probably the, the size of Eastern Europe. Okay, so, so all the way here from Valdosta and Fort Washington to upstate New York, I mean, the, basically four of the autopsies were done at St. Jude, okay? In fact, it's not at St. Jude, it's not my neuropathologist that does the autopsy, it's the regular pathologist, but all the others we were able to set up, some of them in the, in the best clean, uh, uh, children's hospital uh, in the country, so, so there were two that, uh, that um, in fact, Mark's uh, colleague, Dr. Susan Chi, she, she had two of her patients uh, do, but several others in top uh, uh, um, children's hospital. Some of them, one of them was done by, by a medical coroner. So, so these families are very motivated to do it. And behind each, each dot of this, there, there's, there's, a, there, there's a story, I mean, about, uh, about, uh, about getting this tissue, about this. this. Uh, one of this, I think this one here, it's in fact, it's a half Amish family from, from nowhere in the middle of the woods in, in Ohio that uh, they drove six hours to get, uh, to get uh, they, they were so motivated, they wanted to get this tissue uh, for research purposes. Um, so the autopsies have been performed at 16, uh, 16 different sites, institutions in 12 different states in the United States. Um, all autopsies were performed within 24 hours. Some of them were done within like two or three hours. A good share of them were done within uh, uh, um, um, six hours. And uh, I think the longest one was 23 hours. 
And uh, basically, what I can tell you is that we have already um, reviewed the DNA uh, of all the samples. So, so DNA of excellent quality was retrieved. Interestingly, uh, five of 26 tumor samples demonstrated degradation of, uh, of the DNA. So we tried to get other tumor samples, and they, they were still degraded. And it's interesting, because uh, in four of them, the normal um, brain control was perfect. So, so it's to show that the issue was not with the collection. The issue was with the tumor. These were so necrotic uh, tumors that, uh, that uh, so basically, there, there was not uh, good quality DNA uh, to get uh, from this. And the, one of the, the patients with uh, one of 21 patients with normal brain tissue uh, also had uh, uh, degraded DNA. And uh, again, I'm not a lab person, but I, I spent uh, one year at Hopkins uh, uh, doing lab work, and I used to work with one microgram of uh, DNA for one year. And some of these patients, we got 400 micrograms of DNA. So I, I joke with people, uh, we could get a, a postdoc fellow for, uh, not one, but 400 of them for the next 400 years. So, so, so we have a um, medium between 100 and 200 micrograms of tumor DNA. Um, the RNA as expected, um, um, we, we saw more degradation. A lot of these patients, they, 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 these places, they didn't have liquid nitrogen available. A lot of these autopsies, they occurred during weekends. And uh, so, so there were some problems there. But I mean, we got 50% of the, of the um, samples um, that had uh, good quality RNA um, for analysis. Um, this is other something very interesting that we are doing. It's um, um, basically, I mean, there were some patients that I got the autopsy before the protocol started. There are some outside effect. There are, there are, I think, six or seven patients that uh, either the physician or the families, they approach us. So, so during weekends, and uh, I mean, basically to, 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 to give this as a gift, as a gift of life, as I like to say. And um, so we don't include this, but I mean, uh, since June 2006, out of the 36 patients, consecutive patients that, uh, that were treated at St. Jude and they have died, so patients that came as consults were not included here. So patients where we had a relationship with the families and they received their full treatment at St. Jude. So, so these are the statistics. So, so the, autopsy was, the issue of autopsy was raised and the parents consented in 14 uh, cases. The issue of autopsy was not raised in, in 10 cases, including three of my patients because the families, they chose to go elsewhere. The, the, my relationship with the families was broken. So, 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 so even I didn't have the guts, as they say in English, to, to raise an issue of autopsy. But I mean, we, have, we had physicians among us that didn't feel comfortable about raising the issue of autopsy. And uh, so, so, so um, but I mean, there were several of our families that, uh, that raised the issue, and the 13 cases declined. So just to show you, even, uh, I mean, so these are families that, uh, that had high motivation, and uh, even, I mean, you, you see the, 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 the consent rate is, uh, is not uh, that great. Um, I think the last thing, and uh, I told you about the questionnaire. We are getting a, a feedback, I mean, getting the cultural uh, background of these families, and, uh, and asking questions, how this autopsy affected their grieving process. And uh, I think at this point, I mean, we have uh, uh, close to 20 patients, and th th this will, will patients, of, uh, parents of, 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 the, of the student that passed away. And uh, this, this, I can tell, it's a consensus. They all, I mean, they did, they did for altruistic purposes, and, uh, and they all, I mean, th th there's no regret there. I mean, there, there's nothing uh, cosmetically and uh, th th uh, for visiting purposes, for funerals. I mean, no one has raised uh, any issues on this. Again, done not only at St. Jude, it's not a special place. I mean, this was done throughout uh, uh, North America. Um, one thing I need to apologize, two things. Um, first, I was hoping my, my, my knowledge of soccer over the years has decreased so much. And I, I, before coming here, I'm Brazilian, so I was planning to have a picture of Ronaldinho <laughs> for you guys. And uh, then I realized Ronaldinho doesn't play anymore for, for Barca. Then, then I didn't bring my computer because I wanted to put the Juninho. I understand Juninho spoiled you guys uh, this week, but I didn't have a chance uh, to do that. The second thing is that um, we have done some, the, so what about the, the genetic analysis? And um, I can tell you we have done already uh, some preliminary uh, work. One of uh, the, the person doing this work with me, it's uh, Susan Baker, okay? She, so she's in development, uh, the Department of Development and Neurobiology at St. Jude. So she's the one that's running all these uh, genome-wide studies. So, so she has done already analysis of some of the samples. And uh, um, I don't know if there's a plan to have this meeting next year, um, but I, 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 wherever we meet uh, in a year, I'm hoping to, to, to be able to get you these results. So, um, 
Uh, Susan Baker is the, is, the, is the PhD that's doing this work. David Ellison, as you may know, I mean, he's the senior pathologist. He has reviewed all these samples. And I can tell you, I mean, as a, what Mark was saying, that sometimes these tumors are misdiagnosed. We haven't seen a, a single case that's not a glioblastoma. In fact, it's very interesting. I mean, the, the also the, 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 these tumors have unique characteristics uh, um, um, as, as opposed to high-grade gliomas in children arising elsewhere in the brain. Amar Gajar, who is my boss, um, Justin is, uh, is also a neuro-oncologist that treats a lot of these patients, and Anne-Marie McClellan is our, is our um, is who, whoever put, who the, the person who puts everything together. And the support, I mean, from, from the, the Division of Neuro-Oncology, Sanjut Alsak is the American Lebanese Syrian Associated Charities that uh, support Sanjut, and the two, just like Alicia Puyo Foundation, I mean, we have two others that, uh, that support us. Thank you.